foraging. Um, this is actually Porcini's in Adelaide. So when I moved to Australia 13 years ago, what reactivated my love of mushrooms on shore was actually Porcini hunting in Adelaide. So the king of all mushrooms, as they call it, and uh, a very exciting find. There we are. Um, but today, mostly, we'll be talking about growing oyster mushrooms at home. And the reason we choose oyster mushrooms at home is because they are voracious and they tend to eat most of their competition. So they're quite forgiving for beginners. So if you get a contaminant, sometimes they'll eat the contaminant rather than fall over and fight, which is really nice. So you want vigorous strains of oyster mushrooms, especially um, to make sure that all your labors equate in the probability of a really good haul. Uh, just to start, we'll talk a little bit about the basics of, of how they grow. So what you see when a mushroom grows is actually the fruit of the apple tree, as they say, and that the apple tree itself is the mycelium or the network underground. So when you go into the pine forest and you kick over the forest floor and you see that white fluffy stuff underneath, oftentimes that's the mycelium. And when that is ready to reproduce, it creates a fruit. And the fruit then comes up out of the ground. And why many mushrooms have a cap is they open the cap out, produce the spores that fall out of the cap, and then get carried by the wind to um, meet and reproduce in new places. The mycelium itself is, um, is made out of hyphae, and that's kind of tubes of, of water and mostly chitin, which is similar to insect exoskeletons. And that's how they actually find their food and, and what they do in, in the environment. Uh, some interesting things about their ecology, and these are important kind of basics to know for cultivation as well. They break down large insoluble molecules. They digest before they ingest. And the way they do that is they read their environment as to what foods and substrates are available. They have a certain deterministic intelligence. And then they choose how to switch on certain exoenzymes. So it's like we would have stomach juices, right? And they choose the exoenzyme, put it out there, dissolve the food, and then ingest it. And that's why they're so good for microbioremediation, which is cleaning out things in the environment. Um, and that's also one reason why they're such great recyclers of nutrients back into our system. If, if it weren't for mushrooms, we'd be kilometers deep in debris from all the things that had lived before us. <clears throat> this is a photo of mycelium. It's a bit hard to see because of our projection and the lights in the room. But right about here, you can see a few of the little tiny threads, the little hyphae. So this is, this is what you're looking for when you're a mushroom grower. You want the white fluffy stuff. And, and as you start to get into it, you start to notice the difference between mycelium healthy or mold, mold unhealthy. So we'll talk about that a little bit in a minute. And that's the inside of a healthy bucket in mo most of the way into colonization. Um, so when you're doing mushrooms, you, you'll create your buckets and then you leave it to colonize for the mycelium tree to fully cover that bucket. And then it will fruit out the side of the bucket. I'll show you some photos of that in a minute. So that's, that's when they, um, they sense air outside the bucket. They then pop out and pin and create mushrooms. So you've got your 20 liter buckets and you've drilled holes in them. You stack it with the food they like. You leave them alone for a month so they consume it all. And then you uncover the air holes and you tell them the fruit. So we'll talk about all that in detail. And they're really, really pretty. There's lots of photos of these. <laughs> Um, these are spores. Uh, we'll talk a, a bit more about them later. You're probably familiar. If you find a mushroom, you can take the cap off and put it on a piece of paper and get a spore print. And the color of that spore print is one of the key identifiers of what mushroom you have. There are many identifiers. Um, so now we're going to go a bit deeper into cultivation because we only have so much time together. Um, your handouts kind of chronicle this process a bit, and I'll go, I go through it in much deep, more detail following that, uh, but I'll do a high level first because there's parts of the process that we don't cover today. So when you are, um, this is from Paul Stamets book, he's the, the fungi fanatic number one Googleable in the world right now. And um, in his book, he has a really nice diagram that I use to show you um, what it takes to go all the way from a spore print at the top to cultivated logs at the bottom. 
And the process has different levels at which you can enter depending on um, how much skill or, or time you want to put into it. So we're just going to go through this diagram um, broken down in a minute. Oh, that's really hard to see. Oh, that's really hard to see. Let's well, try saying we're not Um, I think we'll be okay. I'll, I'll, I'll figure it out. There's a big diagram of it over there that you all can look at in detail on your way in or out. Um, so the, the top part of this is if you are going to actually collect your own spores, you need to collect them and you put them on agar plates in order to grow them out. You want to make sure they're not contaminated. And then you would sterilize a master grain spawn in a pressure cooker and you would transfer those grains from that into the, um, the grain medium. And this is, you're making at this point what's called master spawn. So that means it's a high virility strain of mushrooms. Um, so when you grow a strain over and over, it gets what's called senescence, which means the genetics of it deteriorate. So when people go and catch wild strains, this is the process they use. This is for the real geeks in the room. What we're gonna talk about today is what happens from that point down, because you can buy spawn online and you don't need an autoclave. You don't need a flow hood. Um, and it keeps a lot of the sterilization burden um, on the, the supplier that you get. So you'd inoculate your grain medium and you'd expand it then into um, another sterilized medium. So you're trying to um, get the right amount of seeds, if you will, spawn. So you would then um, add a known spawn that's growing to other jars to expand it out and then you feed it a substrate. So at that point, um, you would have in this jar grain that had been sterilized, that had had a mushroom in there that had grown all throughout it. And that is your bulk spawn. And that you would mix with substrates, which is the food it likes. And depending on the mushroom, it can be different things. Sorry guys, this looks better at home. <laughs> um, and then you can choose whether it goes into logs, which is in the upper right hand corner, if you're gonna do mounds or bed culture, garden bed culture, bag culture, which is large poly bags that have holes out the sides, um, bucket culture, which is the process we're gonna go through in detail here today. I choose to teach this process because the materials are the most readily available to us. We can use cold pasteurization, which I'll tell you about in a minute, which eliminates the need to propane boil large vats of straw and things for sterilization. It's an amazing technology improvement in hacking mushrooms at home. And then um, tray culture, which these two over here, these are kind of the ones that are for home growing. Bag culture is good as well. Um, and then mound, I would probably try after you've done buckets. Um, and logs are pretty simple, but you, you need to like drilling logs and plugging them with the, the mushroom plugs. So it's a bit fiddly, but those logs can fruit for Logs will colonize for between six months to two years, depending on the strain, but they'll fruit seasonally for quite a few years to come. So they can fruit for two to five to 10 years. When they do shiitake in Japan, it's all like these log, um, log stacks in the forest. A bucket will flush maybe three times. You'll get maybe between, on a really bad day, you'd get a kilo or a kilo something from it. And through three or four flushes, hopefully you get two kilos or so out of it. it there's lots of calculations on biological um, efficiency once you start to want to do the numbers on, on what you're doing. So that's the technique, high level. Um, and those techniques, the reason mushrooms are so interesting in the world is because they can grow exponentially. Once you have a master culture, and you've sterilized enough mushroom food, you can actually colonize quite a lot of stuff. But you need to have your food um, cold pasteurized or sterilized so that the contaminants don't win. Because you're always in a battle with the contaminants and the mushrooms. So as a mushroom coach, our job is to eliminate all the competition and rig the game in favor of the mushrooms. Okay, so this, uh, if that's, I'm going to do the, the smallest scale first for anyone who's overwhelmed already, and then I'm going to go through in very um, picture filled detail how it looks like at home when you want to grow buckets. Sound good? So for the smallest scale, 
You can buy a ready to grow at home fruiting block in a bag, um, put some perlite in the bottom of a Tupperware you've drilled holes for. Mushrooms breathe oxygen, so they need a lot of good airflow. And, um, and you spritz this with um, just a spray bottle quite a few times a day, and you can grow shiitake under the bed if you'd like for small scale, and it feels pretty good. You can also buy the grow your own boxes, really good way to start just to get a feel for the cadence of the daily spritzing, the paying attention to, is it drying out if I put it on this side of the kitchen or that side of the kitchen? So I really recommend, um, if you've never tried it at all, um, buy one ready to grow, um, grow at home block kit and, and try what's called a shotgun fruiting chamber because it's like we shot the, the box with a shotgun. I think that's why we call it that. Or a, um, a grow at home kit. Because you, you start to understand the cadence and the amount of water that they need because they're very much water powered in every way possible. So that's a spritzing. <laughs> and I mean, you can grow really beautiful, very small scale with just one block in a box. Like you, you don't need to go full on and remodel the entire carport for this hobby yet. <laughs> But you will eventually. <laughs> you will. So now we're going to go on the big, the big ride through the mid scale, and I'm going to show you how it looks like when we do it in our carport in the workshops when we teach people how to do it. This is our aim: a very happy, highly fruiting bucket. Um, those are yellow oyster mushrooms. You pick the the strain you're going to grow based on the season. So if you're going to grow on the slightly warmer ends of the season, about 22 to 24 degrees average temperatures, then you're gonna pick pink oysters. Yellow oysters are a bit more delicate. Blue oysters do better in cooler temperatures and so do white ones. Um, so when you are picking which oyster strain, um, check its fruiting temperature. Um, most online suppliers will tell you what its fruiting temperature is and that's the temperature at which you will have to maintain it to fruit. While it's colonizing, it can handle a, a few other things, but when you want it to fruit, its trigger is that temperature. So important to pick pink for the warmer months, blue for the colder months, just as a, as a bit of a high level ruler. That's me getting ready to end them. Um, when you're done, you can compost everything you've made. So this is my shot to remind you all, we are permaculture folk as well. So everything you do in the buckets can go in the garden later. and. Sometimes if you're very lucky, you might even get more mushrooms in the garden. But that's the inside of a block when it's been fully colonized. So that's it about, um, that's once it's fruited and once it's colonized, you can see we cut off, like that was one of the holes there and that's where it was cut off. So the only fruit where they're exposed to air and oxygen. So you have any cracks in your bucket, they're gonna come out sideways. You decide to do it in, um, we did it in worm farm trays so we could grow them out the bottom. That was also entertaining. So we've done laundry baskets and they fruited literally out, out the whole thing all the way around it. Um, sorry, I have a few too many photos there. Uh, so to do the process, I put this on your front page, is you've got to collect a few things to start to think about it at this scale. So you've got your 20 liter buckets. Um, the mushroom coop, which we'll talk about in detail in a minute, it's basically a mini greenhouse with a humidifier into it. Um, spawn bags, so you'll need bags of spawn. I recommend you buy them online just to start, uh, but there are some local suppliers. People have gone very quickly from, I grew one block at home and I can do this myself and um, decided to produce their own spawn. You'll need substrates, which is what we call their food. Uh, cardboard, straw, um, chaff straw, which is sleeping bedding straw, not straw with wheat grains in it. We'll talk about that in a minute. Coffee grinds, grain, um, wood shavings, not pine or any resiny wood doesn't work because those woods tend to be um, antibacterial, antimicrobial, and um, they fend off a lot of the biological work we're trying to get. And compost, if you've got hot compost that's um, come out, that little bit of nitrogen in the bucket also sometimes gives them a bit of a boost as well. And then um, 
The major, the major substrate we often use is straw. You can use different mixes of these and we'll discuss that when we talk about the bucket construction. Um, but to cold pasteurize the straw, we use wheelie bin, a wheelie bin full of water with some hydrated builder's lime in it. So we make a basic water solution and we submerge the straw and the cardboard in that. And that is what is called cold pasteurization. The alternative is um, a giant drum of water that you boil it in. And people at scale, when they want very, very certain yields, they, that's how mushroom farmers go, right? When you're getting at that level. So this is just on your front page. I just wanted to talk to you about it. When we are cold pasteurizing, we use um, splashback glasses and chemical gloves and things like that, because it is basic. So it's not terrible, um, but just use some safety gear. So that's just the equipment. Uh -oh. There we are. So this is the step-by-step -step process on a single page. I know it's scary, but it's actually simplified. I've been at this for a minute to get it to make sense for you all. Um, and we're gonna go through all of these bits um, really quickly together. So first of all, you're a mushroom coach. You're here to encourage them to grow. You don't actually do the growing, they do it. Um, your job is to prepare the most hospitable feather bed that Goldilocks has ever seen. That's your goal. Um, a big part of your job is to limit the competition for their food. That's why we're cold pasteurizing, sterilizing, washing buckets. Um, I tend to do things on the slightly less sterile end because I don't want to put that much effort in in case something fails. I want to I want to balance my expectations with my effort, but that's more of a personality, personal choice um, than that. You will need to wash, sterilize, and pasteurize to limit that competition, and you will additionally need to remove any contaminants and pests. So just like with your gardens and chasing slugs with broomsticks, um, there's a there's a similar version that you have to do with fungi. You will need to source the food they like the different substrates, and you will need to figure out what's the variety of layers in the trifle that they prefer. So the bucket, imagine the bucket is a trifle. Like you guys know that old British dessert where you put the pudding and the, the cracker of the biscuits and the fruit or whatever. So we're making a mushroom trifle in the bucket. This is very, very good visual to remember. The substrates are quite diverse. As I mentioned, the stuff earlier, you do, you're still doing the same thing you do when you do compost. You're, you're thinking about your carbon and your nitrogen balances. There are endless forums on the internet about people arguing about what which strain of mushroom likes to eat. Um, oyster mushrooms have a pretty simple formula. Give them all the straw and grain that they want with a bit of cardboard and coffee grounds. You know, Bob's your uncle. Uh, we grow oyster mushrooms to start because they're hungry and they are tough and they recover and they're generous to beginners. And they fruit really well and they're tasty. They have all their own preferences. So microclimates and the choices of where you put them in your space can shift their energy and how much they'll fruit. So I've done it where like, I've had them colonizing under the bed in a bag once and then I moved them somewhere else and the shock of the move made them immediately fruit. So there's, it's kind of a, a little bit of a dance. It's like, you gotta imagine you have a crush on them and you're watching them all the time to see what they like. <laughs> so the method goes like this, buckets, get your buckets, check the lid for fit. You really want the lid to make sure you fit and you need to check the sides for any cracks. If there's a crack, they will grow out of it. So you only want them to grow out of the holes that you drill. Um, drill your drainage holes on the bottom. I'd say that's probably a few too many for my liking. There's lots of arguments online as well about hole placement and how many. The traditional idea for hole placement is five to six on the bottom with like a three eighths drill bit probably. And then um, usually some kind of diamond pattern um, around the sides of it. And the reason I think a lot of people choose that diamond pattern is once it fruits, it needs a bit of space to fruit. And they, they'll, so you want to create as much space for fruiting. A lot of the people that I know that have grown them for a long time are on the side of less holes because then it focuses the mushrooms to grow big clumps from those holes rather than lots of small ones. So 
It just depends on your preference. But I've also done it in like an almost open-sided laundry basket and they fruited the whole thing out. So it just depends on if you want them staged out as well. So if you do six buckets in your house and you wanna be picking mushrooms for dinner for a month or so, a few less holes means you can control which ones you put into fruit and pick so that you actually get mushrooms for quite a while for the house rather than um, they just explode into fireworks the first time they sense moisture and air. So, so you, you are very much a coach and you are very much in a, in a symbiotic conversational relationship with them. So you drill your fruiting holes on the side, as I said, staggered. I have literally drilled this few fruiting holes in a bucket and that's fine. So I've drilled like three on one side and three down the other and, and you, you do all right. Off we go with our paddle. Um, after you've drilled your holes, scrub your bucket with water. So just antibacterial dish soap or whatever and get all the little bits of plastic out of it and then your bucket is ready. That was the easy part. <laughs> until you're doing 25 of them. So spawn can be bought online. I've included a list in your notes. Uh, the big one is Aussie Mushroom Suppliers. Um, there's a couple other local ones, Little Acre, Urban Spore. Um, there's a couple even around here in the Northern Beaches and that actually grow the spawn in Gosford. So if anyone's really keen, just send me a message and we'll help connect you to them. This is what spawn comes like when you buy it online. It comes in autoclavable bags and at the top of the autoclavable bag, there is a micropore port, that little white bit there, because they need oxygen. If you leave these alone, they will grow through the micropore. I don't know if you guys know that stuff. It's the stuff they use in hospitals whenever they want it to be taped shut and air to go in and out, but no bacteria to go in. I've seen them grow through the port if they're left on their own devices. But um, these, this, is, this makes mushroom growing really nice when your spawn arrives. And so that's what spawn looks like when it gets here. And you'll, um, we'll do a little bit of talking about how you work with the spawn block. There's some more suppliers. You can call it by the box kit as well. Um, and um, the spawn, so I have a problem with all this plastic, right? I'm a bit of a zero waste waster when I can be at the house or a low plasticer. They can, it can be grown in reusable glass jars. So a lot of people, when they get to a certain point, they don't want to be buying spawn in bags when they do it in glass jars. And I'm, I'm hoping that we start to see more and more mushroom farms doing things in glass and in reusable containers. Or we train the mushrooms to eat the plastic when we're done with it. It's another thing that they will one day be doing. Um, to source substrates, so your straw that you want to use for this method, you want to buy a straw that's for bedding, not for feeding. So there's a straw where they leave the grain with the shaft of the grass, and then there's one where they take just the shaft of the grass out, and that's called chaff or bedding straw. So that's the straw you want, and um, the reason you want that is you don't want to, if you have the germ of it, the grain in it, you have to go to full pressure cooking to sterilize it because that grain comes with a lot of living things in it. If you have just the grass stalk, the chaff, you can do the cold pasteurization method that we're going to talk about here in a minute. One bale can get you through, how many buckets do we do with a bale? Like 16? 16 buckets maybe once? We had a lot of other substrates we mixed with it as well. We had cardboard and stuff. Um, but a bale, once it's soaked in water, can go quite far. I mean, if you're, if you're really like packing your buckets tight, a bale will do 10 to 12 or, or something like that. So one bale will, will get you pretty far. Um, when you get your straw, if the pieces of the straw are too long, um, the, the mushrooms like their food chopped up a bit, not baby food level, um, but you don't want the pieces of straw to be more than like 15 centimeters or so. So either you can, um, like here, we tried to saw the block in half. This was not successful. <laughs> um, this photo was to tell you we learned along the way. We've also done where we throw the straw in a wheelie bin and we get a whipper snipper and we use it like an immersion blender. Wear a mask so you don't <laughs> breathe it in. But we've definitely immersion whipper snipper blended the straw in, um, in wheelie bins as well. Um, when you get your cardboard, you have to pick off all the plastic tape and all the labels. 
And then before you soak the cardboard, we'll see this in a minute, you actually end up peeling the layers of some of the cardboard apart so the water can get in and, and soak it properly. Otherwise, cardboard doesn't soak up water as well as I thought it would. <laughs> Wood shavings. Um, any tree is pretty good. I probably wouldn't use like a tea tree or a pine, like I mentioned earlier. The mellow, anything that's highly resiny or highly oiled, those oils have a purpose in nature and they kind of go against our purpose as a mushroom coach. Um, they'll need to be, the least sterilization I've ever done on wood shavings is I just covered them in boiling water for a while. And I was like, yeah, that's good enough, let's go. The furthest I've gone is I think I've had friends that pressure cook them to sterilize them. So um, it's worked fine with just soaking them in boiled water for a bit. I think my yields were a little bit less, but I didn't have any contamination that made me cry. <laughs> um, shredded paper is really nice and clean. Um, we don't use too much of it though, because it does soak up a bit too much water. So everything that you soak in the hydrated lime water, you, you do want it to drain out a bit so that it's hydrated, but not dripping. Shredded paper is really good though, because then we're, we're our own recycling planet, right? And, and it's also nice because it does add a bit of density to the bucket and it holds a bit of good moisture when you're making your try. <laughs> coffee grounds, the good thing if you get coffee grounds from your local cafe, for about two days after, they're pretty much good. You don't have to sterilize them. So two days before or a day before you're going to actually do your buckets, just go and ask the coffee shop, take a bucket up to them and ask them to dump one of the coffee ground bags. And because it's been through such a pressure treated heat, heat treatment, you don't really have to do very much to them. Um, and then grain. So because the mushroom spawn more, more often than not is, um, when it comes in its autoclave bag, it's grown on a grain. So it's been trained to eat grain. It thinks grain is the greatest food since sliced bread. So we need to put a bit of grain in our buckets so that it knows that it's got, it's got food here. And so it hops from the grain that it had in its autoclavable bag onto the grain in the bucket. And then it works its way into the straw and the cardboard and those exoenzymes it produces, it starts to diversify. So in most bucket, production trifles, we put 10 to 15% of a um, pressure cooker cooked grain. So like wheat grain or whatever, 90 minutes at 15 PSI in a pressure cooker. Some people say, I mean, we got lazy one day and just boiled them. You're getting at the hang of how I do this friends <laughs> and it worked fine. It's probably a little more contamination than some people would want to tolerate. Um, so that's it. That's some of the examples. That's our grain cooked in the bucket some of our straw lying around in cardboard um, getting prepped. We've done that, we've done that, we've done all this in detail. So how are we gonna prepare all these substrates? As I said, um, each substrate takes a slightly different way of prepping, some of them a bit more work than others. So the ones that are inherently low contamination because of how they come to you, coffee grounds, cardboard's pretty sterile-ish, it doesn't have that many living things in it, either does shredded paper. Wood shavings, depending on the shavings in their environment, not too bad. The straw and the grain are the ones that, um, that, we, that we really need to watch out for because they're the most um, kind of living thing associated with. So as I said, with straw, that's my, that's my wheelie bin um, whipper snipper immersion blender setup, and it needs to be chopped into its length. Cardboard. Uh, we do what's called the roulade method. Well, I don't know. We call it, we say we roll them into roulades or burritos. So you peel off the facing cardboard um, on one side and you roll that into a burrito. And so then when you when you put it in the um, in the solution, it can co go. You know how the corrug if you put the corrugations vertically, like you roll it into a burrito like this, and then the corrugated bits like this, the water can go all the way in and soak the cardboard fully because it travels up the corrugations as if it was a chimney. I should have a picture of that, like that. So that, that means like you don't have to soak it too much. It just helps it a bit. And then the cardboard is really useful because like where you have your holes in the bucket, sometimes I'll, I'll just grab a bit of paper and I'll cover the hole with, the, with one layer of cardboard so the mushrooms can go through it and they have to fight their way to the air. And I really know they want to fruit. Sometimes people cover those holes and then uncover them when they want them to fruit. Once again, I'm too late. <laughs> 
Shredded paper and cardboard only need 30 minutes in the lime water, the hydrated lime water. Um, and it's on your worksheet and we'll talk about it in a minute about how to make that hydrated lime water. Uh, you strain them and dry them after and coffee grounds are pretty good. Um, if they're any older than that, you, in any older than two days, you do need to boil and strain and dry them again. At that point, I would say it's not worth it. Go get another bucket from the cafe fresh. Um, grain will need to be boiled with a very minimal amount of water to, to get it to a certain hydration point. There's the whole sub process to figuring out how much all this stuff needs to be hydrated. And when you're doing a proper mushroom farm, they don't even, they only put the right amount of moisture into stuff, right? When they efficiency their processes. So everything's getting soaked because the mushrooms are gonna need that water to grow. So grain will, um, will get boiled with water to a certain hydration point. But generally like we've done the grain before where we just put it in a pot, boiled it with water al dente, if you will, and then um, strained it, let it cool, threw it right in the buckets and that was fine. Um, so I'll talk about this hydration point thing just for a minute. So when we're growing mushrooms and you go online, people will start talking about what you call biological efficiency. How much weight of stuff did I put into it or how much weight of mushrooms did I get out of it? And in order to obtain the right biological efficiency and crank it up, people do, um, people do hydration point calculations about how much water do I actually need to put into the dry stuff to get the right amount of mushrooms, you know, when they do all their maths. So what we do with the grain is you weigh out 100 grams of it, you pop that in the oven, and you dry that grain out. So this is, this is to set how much water you need. You're doing the little test to get the math. So you dry all the grain out, and then um, you do a small test with that portion for how much water you need to cook with it, and then you scale it up to your big batch. Um, so most grain gets hydrated to like 100% hydration, um, but you don't, you don't want to have so much water in there cooking your grain that you end up cooking oatmeal or mash. So that's the only reason why I tell you about um, being careful in cooking your grain to al dente because I have accidentally made mash and had to start over. And then you dump your grain and you lay it all out for it to evaporate and dry. Um, so now let's just go back to this cold pasteurization method that we do with the straw, the cardboard, and the paper. So the straw, the cardboard, and the paper, we do cold pasteurization. Ideally, you would use rainwater or non-chlorinated water. Um, the reason why is if you soak it in chlorinated water, like the tea tree resins and the pine shaving resins, it will kill other things in that environment and it, will, it, it changes how you work with your mushrooms. Um, there's different things online about that. I mean, most of the world lives in flocculated water areas, which means there's chlorine and, and fluoride in all our water. So I do think that it works. Um, other mates in the US have grown this way. Um, so when you're making lime water, one, another thing about mushrooms is there's a million people doing it with a different recipe for every single, every single way they do it. So um, when I'm making lime water, you use builder's lime or hydrated lime, you know, the stuff you, you build to, you buy to make cement with or masonry cement. And the, the calculations that I work for is about four cups of hydrated lime to 208 liters, which is, it's a 55 gallon drum or like one of your really big wheelie bins, three quarters or a bit more than three quarters full. Um, three, so four cups or 300 grams. Uh, to, to um, a mostly full wheelie bin of water, it gets you the right um, basic pH. A lot easier though, if you just buy a pH test strip, test your water, add lime until you get to a pH of about nine, nine plus, which is basic enough. Um, this, this two to five down here, this is what I want you to notice. This is where people do very different amounts of concentration of hydrated lime, like, We've done it before where the lime didn't dissolve and it ended up as chunks at the bottom of the wheelie bin. So I totally put in like six cups of the stuff to get it to the right one. And I was like, okay. And then when we dump all the water out, you can see that it's all just hanging out at the bottom. So you can use it again as well. So you can use the water again, add a bit more lime and, um, and dunk your straw in there as well. 
Um, so make sure that it's fully dissolved in there. So wash the wheelie bin beforehand if you can, so that there's, you know, at least with dish soap, that makes sure that it's kind of not adding to a contamination problem in the future. Uh, and then fill it with water. That's us mixing the lime into a bit of a slurry in a bucket beforehand. So we dissolve it and then we put it in the bin and then we put all the straw in the bin and we submerge the straw. So the straw is the first part of your process that you get going because it needs to soak for between eight to 16 hours. And it, then it comes out, I got 10 to 14 here, um, 10 to 14 hours. And then your car, and then once you get your straw out and it's like um, draining on a, a bit of a mesh or a net, or I use a bit of fencing, um, then I put the cardboard in and into the lime water for an hour and a half or two. And by the time you pull the cardboard out, if you've cooked your grain, you've got all your components ready to layer your trifold. So there's a bit of coordination. Once your straw has been soaked, when it comes out of your lime water, it comes out like English mustard yellow. Like, so once it's been cold pasteurized, it is, um, it's quite distinct. It's got a bit of an odor to it, nothing too bad. Um, but you know, you feel like you're doing something. Stuff's changing color. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to put in this one little note because we're, we're quite eco-conscious as a crew. Um, lime water is basic. We don't pour it down drains or directly into gardens. To neutralize it, you pour in a bit of acid. So a bit of vinegar, or you can throw some citric acid in it. Um, I've done it even before where someone told me there was a certain garden charcoal I could throw in it and that neutralized it and that worked. So once you've neutralized it a little bit, you take it down from about a nine and a half pH to like a seven seven of course is fine and then it can just go go into anything if you will and you can even leave it a little bit basic and then the lime water isn't terrible for the garden some things love it there are some um basic loving weeds as well <laughs> um so by that point you've got all your stuff ready i told you you know straw we cold pasteurized for eight to 16 hours Cardboard we soaked for an hour and a half to two hours in the lime water. Paper can just take a quick 30 minute, 15 minute dunk in the lime water, and that's probably enough. Coffee grounds probably came to you fresh, so they're good to go. Grain's been boiled and um, laid out to cool. Wood shavings boiled and laid out to cool. Buckets have been drilled and washed. You bought your spawn online. Wow, wasn't that easy? Yeah. We're ready to make trifles, friends. <laughs> um, so this is the layering of a bucket. This is in your pack as well. I thought this was an important one. Tell you what goes in the trifle. Um, composition can vary, but 50 to 60% straw for the beginner's bucket process. And then everything else kind of 10 to 15%. So 10% wood chips or coffee, 10% grain, 10 paper, 10 to 15% spawn. And the spawn, when you take it out of the bag, you, you try to leave some big chunks of it together. Like you don't want to crumble your spawn because then you're, you're breaking up all the actual mycelium. You kind of want big chunks wrapped with all the food they want, right? So delivering them like the rock stars they are. Um, and then when we start layering, um, big wad of straw in the bottom of the bucket. I think I have a photo of that. Yeah. So the first layer at the bottom to cover the drain holes is a big wad of the straw. And then you start to um, build your way upwards. So this is us, for example, chunking up. So those there, those are chunks of the grain spawn from the bag. It comes out of the bag and it's all the grain with the white mycelium through it. So it is solid, but if you really wanted to crumble it, you could. But so you, you grab a chunk of that. Um, and we, we kind of wrap them up sometimes in a burrito of like of some of the soaked cardboard or whatnot, just to give them a little bit of um, initial food right up really close. And then, uh, so that was us making a little, a little seed packet and we pack it all in the buckets. And then uh, I'll just go back to the trifle photo for a minute. So then you're, then you're on, then you're in a production line. Big water straw, bit of grain, spot in big chunks. Throw on a bit more grain and a bit more shredded paper, another big wad of straw, um, wood chips, coffee, occasionally pop a layer of cardboard in. Maybe you're putting a bit of cardboard around the bucket just to, um, just to cover up some of the holes. 
Um, and then you just keep going. Mycelium, spawn, chunks, grain, straw, cardboard. Grain, straw, cardboard, chunks of spawn. Chainsaw. Yeah. So that's us at the end of the day. There, it, we had like five or six of us in the carport first workshop we did at our house. And I think we made 24 different buckets. And so everybody got to take home four or five of them. So it's, it, it's a lot more fun when it's a bit more community focused. I would love in the like northern side of Sydney, like this becomes a lot more feasible, for example, if we were to have like bucket building days and like people came together to do it because it does have quite a few bits. But you know, the two of us have done it before in a weekend. So it depends on how much you want your mushrooms. Um, so I'll just talk a little bit around garden beds because it's not actually that different a process to get it in a garden bed. Um, you're basically making a bit of a valley with um, some cardboard and then just like the bucket, you're layering um, the same stuff into the trifle in the um, in the valley, if you will. I have photos of that. So we dug a trench in the garden. Um, we laid the cardboard down just to give it its its separateness from the dirt for, to give it a bit of a, a head start. And then we start layering just the same way. Wood shavings, paper, etc. Keep going, keep going. Compost as well. I didn't put compost in the trifle um, ingredients list because it depends on um, how well composted is your compost. But if you know it's fresh and it's hot and it's been well composted, it's a really nice nitrogen source and it can improve the, the yields in your bucket. Um, yeah, so that's us layering that up and there's our buckets. So once you've made your buckets, um, they need to colonize. So what you do is you put them in a nice out of the wind place and you can leave them alone for between two to four weeks, maybe six weeks if you have a really slow, cold environment. And what's happening in the bucket over those four to six weeks is from the mycelium chunks that you put in the trifle, that little white mycelium is branching out and eating all the food and solidifying its territory of the whole bucket is mine. And once that happens, you can lift the lid, like I showed you at the very beginning, and you can see the white froth. Like literally when they're fully colonized, you lift the lid on it and you look like you're looking into marshmallows. Like they are so fluffy and healthy. It's very exciting stuff. Um, at that point, you want them to fruit. And sometimes you start to communicate with them about how you fruit. How you communicate with them is you move them into a hospital fruiting environment or what I call the mushroom coop, much like chickens, just slightly less food. Um, and so we stack them up. We put a humidifier in there. Um, this, is, this is mine. It was just a metal shelf found in the back garden wrapped it in painter's plastic. And then um, that was my buckets. Square buckets did not do well. Not my jam, don't, not, don't know why. The square buckets and I, we did not mesh well. Round buckets, gangbusters. Worm farm trays, gangbusters. Maybe it was that this was the sunny side of the shelf, the windy side of the shelf, the bucket was too small. Call me when you want to troubleshoot. This is like one of my favorite Saturday afternoon things. Why won't my mushrooms grow? I love this game. Um, so they, there's your humidifier in the coop. And literally, it just stays wrapped up. And I go in once a day. I have a look. I harvest anything. So um, just when it comes to harvesting, you want to harvest when the edges are still turned down. That means that they haven't started to flare their gills and put all their energy into sporing the world. So what happens is as they age, this one's a little older, you can, you can kind of sense it. This edge, this lip is getting thinner here. So as they age, they get bigger and then they start to flare and that lip gets thinner, their gills get bigger and wider and they put all their energy into sporing and they'll cover an entire room in white powder and dust. You don't want them indoors where you're gonna breathe them. Mushroom lung is a thing. Um, so when you're fruiting, you want a bit of a somewhere else with airflow where you can keep them nicely um, wrapped up. That is a perfect time to harvest when they look really plump and plush and the edges are still turned down. 
And, the, and, and another reason we harvest at this stage is that they supposedly have a bit more flavor. I don't know, maybe, I mean, it seems logical, right? Before they put their energy into spores. Um, so there's various ideas on how to get them to fruit. Honestly, once mine have colonized and I put them in a humidifier environment where there's constant humid air, they generally fruit on their own. Sometimes people dunk them in water, especially if you're doing a block or um, a laundry basket version, for example, and it's got a lot of air holes, people will dunk them in water. And that's what's called the primordia shock. Um, primordia are when the, when the mushroom mycelium is coming to the air, it gets these tiny little pins that come out that are the pre-mushrooms, they're called primordia. So in order to fruit them, in the technical language, you'll hear people talk about primordia shops. When people are growing shiitake commercially in places like Japan, where they've done it for many, many centuries, the logs are in the forest, they dunk them in water, sometimes they electric shock them. Some people believe primordia shock can happen from a physical um, thumping as well. So sometimes there's a little signal to them, you know, to, hey, come out, one to play. Um, their happiest place is lightly ventilated and they do need light. So everyone's saying mushrooms only like the dark. This is not true. Mushrooms are a critical light seeking organism. Light is actually one of the major triggers to fruit because they know there's air there. And if there's air, their spores will be carried on the wind. So a little, when you want them to colonize, you wrap them in black plastic and you give them just enough airflow to, for those two to four weeks while the bucket's colonizing um, so that they grow in the bucket. And when you want them to fruit, you take them out of the dark, you give them a bit more air and a bit more humidity and they know that it's time to go. That's when you're the coach. Get in there, get in the game, we're putting you in. Um, when you wanna uh, harvest, uh, grab a knife, sterilize the blade a little bit because the cut point becomes a contamination point. So do try to harvest um, with a fairly clean or sterile knife um, and cut as close and as flush to the base as possible. No shame and no fear of harvesting mushrooms. They exist to be harvested, right? Even when you're foraging, we have lots of arguments online about this in foraging groups. How much did they take? Too much. It's fine. Harvest them, use a sterile knife, make clean cuts. Um, yeah, harvest before the edges curl upwards and the sporing begins. Possibly because of flavor, but also you don't want them sporing all over the place. It turns everything chalky and it increases your chance of contamination because spores breed and hold moisture. Um, spores are carrying the, the reproductive DNA of the mushrooms, so it's yummy to microbes. It's, it's juicy, it's rich. So if they start sporing and you have them sporing, you're, you're increasing the chance that something's gonna go wrong. After you've dunked them and you've put them in the coop, you've fruited them, you've harvested them, you can dunk them again and you can do it all again. And you might get usually about half the yield again. So when I did the buckets the first time around in the carport, the first fruiting per bucket was about a kilo. Second fruiting was about 600 grams. Third fruiting was another 300 grams or so. So it's a curve, it's a diminishing returns curve. Um, some people do <laughs> make jokes online about 12 flushes when they're just, they just won't stop. I'm like, you're trolling me. This is not possible. <laughs> Usually by the third fruit, the third flush or the fourth flush, you're ready to compost. At that point, the return is so diminished. It, you're doing more work than it's worth. Um, yeah. So once you colonize that bucket, you can dry it into bricks. I've got my, my little wad here. This is for traveling. This is the traveling slice of bucket. So this is the bottom slice of a bucket after it's been colonized fully. So you can see in the cross section here, this is the straw, that's some of the wood pellets and the white stuff is the pure mycelium that's dried out a lot. So that's pure chitin. And you know, I, it's, it's holding together pretty well. But yeah, this is where myco bricks come from. One day our houses will be grown out of self-healing mushrooms, I believe, but that's my religion, not yours. Um, we have a lot of materials that we can do with this. This goes great in the garden. Lots of things love to eat this. Um, really fun for composting. And um, feel free to come and have a, a gander at that in detail when the time comes. 
Third fruiting, put them in the bed, not worth it. It's just my opinion. You can argue with me online. Um, happy mushrooms, happy life. So that's the body of this spit. You guys have your sheets. I'm sure you have heaps of questions. You got a whirlwind tour. So. Mm -hmm. uh, when you wash them with uh, antibacterial like, could you also dry them in full sun? Totally. Always use use the solar power because I just think it's one more thing. Everything that you can, everything that you don't have to do more work to get a better result, I would totally dry them in the sun. I keep saying that from a uh, like a kilo, a kilo and three quarters or so. Right. Um, from yeah, from one bucket. But so twenty liters is the volume of the bucket. Sure. The weight, the dry weight of what goes in the bucket. So, okay, I'm gonna take it back a step so I can explain it well. 20 liters is the volume of the bucket. Yeah. In the bucket go all the substrates. When you originally source them all, they have a dry weight. Yeah. That weight you need to calculate. That's the weight that we calculate our biological efficiency on. So to the dry weight of everything that goes in it, you add the moisture and the spawn, and then you would calculate your efficiency. So the weight of what's actually in the bucket is probably around, if you're getting 1.75 kilos out of it, 100% biological efficiency would be 1.75 dry weight went into the bucket. And 100% efficiency is, is pretty good, but people do get 100, they get above 100% efficiency. So the, the mushroom mass still kind of feels a bit trippy to me when I'm doing it, um, but you're calculating efficiency on the dry weight of what you put into it, um, to the wet weight of the mushrooms that came out of it. And the water that you add in and out is, is just a part of it. So the kilo, when um, the bucket, when it's wet, weighs maybe two or three kilos. The 20 liter bucket weighs two or three kilos. And you would, well, maybe four kilos if you really, you know, smashed it in there. And then you would get your 1.75 to two kilos of mushrooms out of it. And that humidifier is going to be 24-7 for how long? Yeah, it depends, pretty much. Uh, some people use fans as well. A lot of people automate that stuff as well. Some, uh, some people switch it on and off with automation as well. Mine was going all the time because it was like a side of the road humidifier. So I just turn it on and fill it once a day. It, that one was a two point something liter capacity humidifier. That would run um, a full 24 hour cycle without needing to be refilled. Um, so that, that worked out well. Get a big humidifier, it makes your life easier. But it doesn't sound like efficiencies to do one bucket, does it? No. If you want to do one bucket, just buy, you just buy a fruiting block or a, a ready to grow block. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. The group method sounds pretty good. I think the growth method is where it's at. I haven't figured out how to put it into play yet, um, but I've given enough of these talks and had enough audiences be like, okay, not one bucket. No, it's not a one bucket thing. So I'm figuring out like, do people want to do like, what do you call it? Um, what do you call it when you do permaculture and you go to someone's garden? Yeah, you need you need like a mushroom bee. I think, I think we need like oyster mushroom bee. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, yeah. Like that. yeah. It, and it's cool. We could do some planning and figure out how that would work. Um, you know, with the straw soaking for 10 to 12 hours, we need to have access to a place for two days probably to, to pull everything together. Um, but then, you know, between four to six to seven people, you can very happily, without too much effort, make 30, 40 buckets and you know, if folks do that once or twice a month, everyone's having the mushrooms. Like for example, there's a really cool guy in Lismore named Joel Orchard, who um, he works with the Young Farmers Connect as well, which is a kind of like 
a network for all people that are trying to make their living as young farmers. And he built a 2.4 meter by 2.4 meter by 2.4 meter cube shed. And he had buckets in there and he, it, it's a mushroom farm. It is a actual production mushroom farm in this 2.4 meter shed. And the buckets are stacked in fours. They're on um, pot stands, the ones with wheels. And so just wheels them around. And I mean, he's got a big staging area to do it, but that fruiting house is a full mushroom business farm. Like, I don't know how many um, buckets he's actually having in the fruiting house at any time or colonizing, um, but lots of people get into it a few months down the line, a few years down the line before you know it, they've got their own little mushroom farm in the shed. Yeah. Like, it sounds really complicated when you hear it the first time, but or you do it once or twice and it really does drop in and you're like, oh, this is just like anything that, that needs its choreography, if you will. Selena said definitely do a workshop, so. <laughs> How long did it take you before you became a mushroom farmer? Um, uh, I don't farm them. I, I don't have the space for it. It's not possible. So you got totally hooked then? Uh, first workshop. <laughs> My first workshop was in, in an Adelaide carport from um, Wayne John Slate, who runs Slate's Mushroom House. And he was like, he was just like, I like, he started out the same way, just running around, you know, with a little pop up gazebo in the backyard and, and making handouts just like this. So I just kind of wanted to be like him. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, we can do this. Um, so a couple ways. Uh, when I did it in a laundry basket, I actually put the whole thing in a black plastic bag because that was all holes. And then at the top, I just left one air hole and the plastic was completely let it colonize. And then you take the plastic off and it goes um, in the buckets. All I do is when I'm layering the bucket, I just put a small piece of um, the wet cardboard uh, over the hole and I hope they grow through it. So I don't go in later and puncture the hole or anything like that. Sometimes we pull it out if we can tell that it's like something's being stifled. Um, but your dream is that you put a small layer through it and they just grow right through it and then they fruit and off you go. Um, but the reason I cover the hole is it just helps colonizing to know that no light's getting in there as well. But when, when the white buckets are full and the holes are all blocked up, I will put them somewhere dark and keep them wrapped up because the white plastic, the light still kind of gets through it. And I just think it's better if they're fully covered because then they're imitating being underground, I think. I don't know. A lot of people think that they'd be really good to grow under houses or under stairs or, you know, in cellars or basements. And I'm like, yeah, but those are also dusty places that don't always have good airflow, could have years of contaminants dripping into them. You do, I mean, when people want to grow something with um, an expectable yield, they just buy those green, those like pop-up greenhouses or those pop-up indoor grow rooms. Like the more you seal it up, the more you can control its airflow and its humidity, you're increasing your, your chances of success, so. It's a, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a, a hybrid between growing that. But more and more people are doing what are called large monotubs of spawns and substrates and then putting them in the garden. So the, the mushroom to learn how to grow for garden beds, most often I hear about in Australia is called wine cap mushrooms or king, king strafaria. And the reason why is it does love a bit of wood chips. And um, Wayne John Slate, the guy I learned from, he did a really cool experiment a while ago where he, he actually packed up burlap bags, like he had big burlap bag and he had them all on a pallet, five or six of them, and he let them colonize there on the pallet. And then those bags went into the garden beds and he had the most beautiful aquaculture, um, mushroom vermiculture, like integrated little um, IBC, half gardens made out of those. That was cool. That was really cool. And then he grew like King Strafaria, like um, he grew mycelium as a tile that has a little thing cut in it. And so the seedling goes in the middle of it and the mycelium is your weed mat, if you will. So he grew mycelium like weed mats. So the mycelium protected the seedling till it was really cool. 
And then you could just let it go in the garden. So you didn't need to use any of that black plastic material or any kind of other mulch. It was kind of, so like once you start to see how it works, you get lots of ideas on what you can do with it. I have a question. In the substrate, you said that there were all these specific ingredients. Can you substitute? Yes, people substitute all the time. People use kitty litter pellets because they're paper, a lot of those ones. Um, I mean, the, all the, all the, all the forums on the internet, people are always looking for substrates. I think a big part of the fun of growing mushrooms is what can I feed them and what can I train them to eat? Well, we can do some searching and figure it out. Some things, some things work and don't work because like if it's, if it's like, it just depends on the mushroom and it's, it's, it's tone. The other thing is if you start from agar, if you start at the very top of the process in the agar solutions, people mix in a tiny percentage of the food they want them to eat to get them to start training them. And there's a really famous radical mycologist named Peter McCoy who trained them to eat things like cigarette butts. And that's the same way that like, they find, they find a new strain while bioprospecting in nature. They bring it into the lab, they figure out what it likes to eat and they're like, oh, this one kind of likes plastic. So when you're doing successive generations in agar plates, you can actually successively train it to eat more of what you like. Um, but, but the other strains as well, like the oyster mushroom strain, I think they like variety. I think they like to be entertained, but that might be me projecting them. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah, you can definitely substitute. There's a lot of people that have tried a lot of experiments online. There's, you know, the cocoa choir, cocoa choir people and stuff. So almost everything that you'd ask a question, I would go and I would search for it on the internet because someone in some geek forum has probably tried it, figured it out, failed at it a few times as well. So. Thank goodness for the internet. It got all the amateur mycologists together. <laughs> Could you recommend some Facebook groups or you know, sort of reliable discussion groups? So oh, I didn't, try our way I didn't put that on list. So there's, um, there's gourmet, there's Australian gourmet mushroom growers on Facebook or something like that. I can check it on my phone. Um, if you're into the materials, there's fungal materials and biofabrication. So that's people that are specifically growing for materials and then um, like uh, trying to grow bricks and lamps and stuff like that. That's, I mean, I'm a little bit further on the spectrum, but that's really fun for me. So for you guys, Australian mushroom, gourmet mushroom growers, um, all the foraging groups can often connect you to people that are also growing as well. So there's, there's foraging groups in every state. I mean, I stock them all on the internet. But yeah, gourmet mushroom growers would be the first one for growing at home. Um, long, long history, that group. So lots of knowledge. And then there's other websites like a lot of the people that grow more like psychedelic and active ones, they go to this thing called Shroomery, um, which has a lot of knowledge. There's a lot of knowledge on Reddit because there's also the internet is full of internet people there. Um, it's because Reddit's organized by themes. Um, there's a couple of people that teach uh, that do more online courses in depth as well. I put them on the worksheet and the list. Um, most of those are Aussie folks. So like Urban Culture, Little Acre, Urban Spore. Um, yeah, those are people that are actually building courses to sell online mushroom education. Um, this is like a big intro flyover and a like, let's just do stuff in gardens <laughs> chat. Yeah. So that mix and those recipes are oyster mushroom specific. Every strain will have different ones. There are some that are more wood loving, saprotrophic. And so like shiitake is definitely a wood mushroom. Um, reishi, turkey tail, some of those medicinal ones, the bracket fungi, they grow out of the side of trees. Obviously they would be a wood shaving or a pine shaving. And then when, when people grow those, they they mix up their substrate and they form it into blocks in the bags and it grows the block in the bag. Um, so that's how the, the wood ones kind of go forward. Mm -hmm. 
So the Garricus ones, I don't know very much about them. I've never grown them. They do sell those boxes often at, you know, your Aldi or your uh, Woolies or whatever. I don't know anything about them, but I heard a rumor. I don't know if it's true that all of the peat moss used to grow those is imported from Europe because when they grow in Australian mulch, they grow weird and not good for market. So someone was telling me that when they grow button mushrooms, in order to grow them to the commercial expectation that people are importing mulch, I, I couldn't believe it's true. I'm like, that must not make commercial sense. But if the mushroom wants it, and that's the commercial outcome. So uh, the important part is not the rumor of that story. The important part of that story is the mulch or the shape of it that you use, the, the kind of the water that you use, and small things can change them. Yeah. So, so for agaricus, they do use manure, um, but there's a top casing layer that is a mulch. So the what they're eating is often underneath is a manure, but the spores themselves in the kits that you get, there's usually um, a mulch layer that goes down and the spores go into that. So they, they usually have a couple layers from what I've, I've seen. Mm -hmm. A question for that environment that you're using to when you because you're so carefully sterilizing all of these substrates, <laughs> what environment are you using? Does that have to be a clean environment when you're chucking everything together? I do it in the cardboard. I don't even use a pressure cooker and it worked out fine. But well, I'm having I mean, this there's example. There's some spores that there's microbes in it. Yeah, yeah. So how um, careful do you have to be? I mean, how clean is your cardboard? <laughs> it is not clean and it is full of wind and it is full of junk. Lots of junk carrying lots of dust. Um, we do like, we do try to not like when you're draining out the straw and you're letting it drain like I wouldn't want to leave, leave it sitting there for six hours with the air falling on it but I'm happy to leave it there for maybe an hour while it drains so it's just it's just kind of about um making sensible decisions around it so like we clean and wash all the bins and all the buckets um we we do cold pasteurization for all the paper and all the straw. We boil the grain, we boil the shavings. We don't do anything to the coffee grounds. And that was my minimum viable that I was um, willing to do. So you don't wanna do all of it and then have everything get contaminated. So I, I just picked a balance. I did like maybe half a dozen different ways. I, I learned, I did two, three mushroom growing workshops and I did a half a dozen little activities where I was learning to grow with other people. And then I was like, cool, let's see how I dial this up or dial this down. So we did that in the carport on a nice day, not that windy. I mean, people do it in like outdoor kitchens and stuff. You don't, you don't need to go full, you know, uh, flow hood suit or anything mm -hmm. like that. Um, if you start to grow more temperamental strains, you will want to do that. There, oyster mushrooms are forgiving. That's why what I'm teaching you and telling you about being a bit of a hack is kind of fun and kind of okay because they're voracious and they are on routine. They want to eat everything. And like I've had a bucket where half the bucket went green from mold and then the white tide battled it back. So that's why we start with this mushroom it's fun to play with yeah so you can i mean you could do it in any community garden i prefer to do it outside because it's nicer and you know you're you're in a mask some of the time from the straw and the hydrated lime as well but we're all used to masks now mm -hmm. not like when i started giving these talks um just a balance really whatever whatever is accessible to you but um when they're fruiting for example mine were just it's a brick floor in the carport and that shelf, I just put two pieces of wood down and I put the bucket on that. So they were, you know, they were in contact with the environment. I don't want to coddle them too much. Then I'm going to have to keep coddling them. <laughs> that is Would you have any comments on the growing mushrooms on the walls? Because they're quite big. I haven't done it yet, um, but the process, I, 
you know, research. So you buy the plugs, right? Yeah. So you buy the plugs. Usually, um, you buy a sterilized autoclave bag with the plugs in it with the spawn on them. So if you're buying your pl your plugs, it's called plug spawn online. Um, make sure you have the right species of tree. Um, pressure or deader? I don't remember. I, depending on the mushroom, there's a certain deadness or of tree that they like depending <laughs> on the mushroom. You know, like yeah, actually, it's it's kind of like that because they they're a decomposer, right? So they need to have certain signals from the environment that it's a good time to go. Um, and then you drill holes all along it. You hammer in all that spawn. Most people wax plug them shut. Um, and then they they let them colonize in a dampish environment, usually quite often just lying around the forest floor or in yards, etc. And then when they want them to flush, either you get lucky and it's a very wet season and they flush on their own, or you dunk them yourself in order to get a flush. But those will fruit for much, much longer. These buckets, these are an instance. So this is a this is an this what you've seen today is an entire cyclic process that happens within and of itself. Those are ongoing. So you make the logs, leave them alone to colonize for however long that takes, six to 18 months, depending on the logs, sometimes two years, three, four, depending on the species. Then they'll fruit and they'll fruit for a time. So the payoffs are different, if you will. So how long did your process from beginning to end, from when did you first get your kit to when you eat the mushroom? If I'm just buying the kit? Well, if you start with the bucket. Okay, so, so if I'm doing the buckets? The day you put it all together to when you harvest. So it probably takes a week to collect all the stuff, but that's not active, not, not fully active time. Two days of intensive work to make all the buckets with the straw and the layering and everything like that. Then the buckets go for colonization for two to four weeks. So two to four weeks, no working, no work but waiting. And then you're fruiting. So six weeks? Yeah, two to well, the shortest possible time, four to six weeks. Eight weeks if it's cold, depending on the mushroom. But you can end up with too many. Thanks. That can happen as well. <laughs> so the, the, the other interesting thing is about how do you space and time your bucket production? Because if you make all your buckets, they'll all colonize and then they'll all want to fruit at the same time. So what you can do is you make all your buckets and they all colonize and you move them gradually into your fruiting chamber to control getting your fruiting regularly or you'll, maybe you'll colonize half of them in a slightly colder spot. Um, so the, there's a large bulk where you make a lot at once, but you, you still need to think about how you're gonna stage that so you don't end up with mushroom again. And that's when you have like six kilos of them and you make lots of friends. Yeah. All right. Any questions on, um, no? Cool. Lovely. Well, thank you everyone. So happy. Thank you very much. Ready? I think we need to do a workshop because I don't want to start with one bucket of mushrooms and just too much work. But if we get a group of people, so yeah, we may think about it. So we'll get our living skills team contacting you and getting things arranged. What is the best time for total beginners to start? What season? Right now. Oh, okay, cool. Okay, uh, okay, uh, well, you we can, we can start in July. They don't like full summer because there's only one oyster mushroom that can handle fruiting at above 2022. 20, okay. Um, so they like it now. July, maybe. But they'll, they'll be really happy. They'll be happy to start anytime from now until maybe august because if you start in uh, the latest if you start in august you have to root it by october and then it's hot and you have to think about cooling them all right good to know so we will see if we can squeeze it in because we've got so many workers in know. june july already but we will see it would be great um i can see there's a lot of interest in this 
So, okay. So, we are going to get the handout from you. So, I ask you to give me a file. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, if you could, um, Matt will be sending the file to everyone who has attended it. And I bet we'll have more questions. So, I hope we've got your email address on the handout so we can contact you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, you, you, thank you very much, everyone. So, that concludes the meeting. It, it really is. It really is. It's one of those hobbies that, like, you're like, you look at it the first time and you're like, I don't know about this. It looks like a lot of work. But gosh, when you open the bucket and they're just dropping and they're just, oh, yes. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah.